Welcome to part two of the latest podcast from the Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Well, turning to one familiar corner of the globe, I mean, familiar to these conversations and to the news cycles, the Middle East. The execution by Saudi Arabia of a leading Shia cleric has further raised tensions in the Middle East, in particular between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And the uproar has focused the world's attention on what looks like an increasingly fragile Saudi regime. From an economic and monetary point of view, what are the implications of this crisis? Very important question. You're right about the increasing tensions. So you've got a couple of things going on. One, we have a, a fairly new king, King Salman of Saudi Arabia. He's doing something that is really shaking up the House of Saud. Now for this, you have to go all the way back to the 1930s. But the first king of Saudi Arabia, Al Saud, is, that's where the name Saudi Arabia comes from. I'll try to get the numbers right. I'm estimating a little bit. But I think about 40 wives and, and uh, 75 children, something like that. And these children are, for the most part, half brothers because the women don't count. They count in my world but not in Saudi Arabia. So uh, we're really only talking about the men in terms of the line of succession. So you have this huge uh, kind of herd of 35 or 40 uh, half brothers. Some of them are full brothers because they came from the same wife, the same mother, but a lot of them are half brothers. And so you get these little mini clans of maybe four or five or seven full brothers from a single mother, and then they're half brothers of the other 35 or 40. Now, a lot of them are dead. Of course, they, a lot of these uh, people were born in the 1930s. Some of them a little more recently. The, I think the youngest ones in the 70s, and uh, a lot of the older ones are, are already deceased. But in Saudi Arabia, you pass the kingdom, the kingship, from brother to brother, not from father to son. You know, we're familiar with England. Uh, it'll go from Queen Elizabeth to Prince Charles to I think Prince William is the third in line. But in Saudi Arabia, they go brother to brother. Well, that's been going on for a long time, except now these brothers are dying and getting old and senile, and uh, they're starting to run out of suitable heirs. So King Salman named his son Deputy Crown Prince. The Crown Prince is the next in line, and he made his son Deputy Crown Prince. So he's setting it up to transfer, finally, after decades, to the next generation. Well, this has caused a lot of resentment among some of these other brothers and half-brothers who are still around and their children who are all part of, the, let's call it the third generation, who look like they're being cut out of the line of succession completely. So that's caused a lot of internal intrigue. On top of that, put in the rivalry with Iran, which is bitter and existential. So you've got multiple layers of rivalry. So you've got, first of all, just two powerful countries on opposite sides of the, uh, I'll call it the Persian Gulf. I think that's what geographers and cartographers agree on. Although I'm always very careful when I'm in, in the Middle East and I'm addressing an audience in Kuwait or Dubai or somewhere like that. And I always I try to be as polite as I can. I do refer to it as the Arab Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Arabia, not to insult my host. It, it really is the Persian Gulf. But if you say the Persian Gulf on the on the Arab side, uh, you'll get some dirty looks. So, uh, the, so they can't even agree on the name of the water, right? So one side calls it the Arabian Gulf, the other side calls it the Persian Gulf. The Iranians are not Arabs. The, uh, the Arabs are Arabs and the Iranians are Persians. So you've got different ethnicities and you've got two different religions. It's all Islam, but you've got the Sunni Muslims on the uh, Arab side and you've got the Shiite Muslims on the Iranian side, although you've got a lot of Shiites in Saudi Arabia, particularly the eastern provinces, who are a little bit of a fifth column in the sense that some of them are under Iranian influence. So you've got the normal geopolitical struggles. You've got competition in oil output for you know, a limited amount of dollars. You've got religious divides, historical divides, uh, and cultural divides. And now uh, Iran is trying to create, uh, has pretty far along in terms of a nuclear we weapons program. So uh, you've got all the recipe for basically World War III. Now, in the past, the United States has tried to intermediate this and has exerted its own presence and its own military to try to keep a lid on. But President Obama has decided to withdraw from the Middle East, reduce the U.S. footprint, leave, you know, kind of local hegemonic powers to deal with their neighborhoods, sort of a cop on the beat. And the U.S. has clearly, clearly tilted in favor of Iran. This does not sit well with Saudi Arabia. They consider it a stab in the back. So we might look for Saudi Arabia 
to push back a little bit, if it's looking for a new ally, it would probably look to China. China is the uh, largest purchaser of Saudi oil. The U.S. doesn't buy any, or uh, I shouldn't say any, doesn't buy much oil from Saudi Arabia. Most of that oil goes to China. China, of course, is doing what? Backing away from the dollar. So would Saudi Arabia uh, back away from the dollar and dollar assets in some way. Perhaps they might. So that's another, you know, exchange rate, reserve position worth worth watching. But if, you know, China's dumping treasuries in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's reserves are draining out because they're running a fiscal deficit. So, you know, just to kind of tie all this up, John, we, we bounced around a little bit from Iran to Saudi Arabia and China and back to the U.S. But if you wanted me to sort of try to capture all of these global capital flows in one you know, one phrase or one sentence, I would say that there's a global dollar shortage, the greatest since the 1950s. People say, gee, the Fed printed, you know, almost $4 trillion. How could there be a dollar shortage? Well, the answer is the Fed may have printed $4 trillion, but the world has created about $20 trillion of new credit, dollar-denominated credit. So, yeah, the Fed printed money, but people were printing uh, IOUs faster than the Fed was printing money, and all those IOUs have to be paid back. And now with growth slowing and trade contracting and the Fed raising rates and money coming to the United States, there aren't enough dollars to go around to pay off that debt. So we're looking at massive, massive defaults, uh, outflows from China, outflows from Saudi Arabia, outflows from around the world, debt defaults looming. I mean, this is a, a, a potential global catastrophe, and no one roots for catastrophe, but I would have to say as this plays out, you would certainly want to have some allocation to gold. There, there are fundamental drivers of the price of gold starting with negative real rates and inflation. So those are obvious ones. So if you get into an inflationary world where inflation starts to outstrip the rate of interest, which is called financial repression, and there's no doubt that central bankers favor that, that's a very bullish fundamental case for gold. But that's probably a 2017, 2018 story. But in the shorter run, meaning 2016, you could see gold go up significantly on this uh, fear trade geopolitical risk and basically global uh, financial, you know, if not a complete meltdown, and certainly a lot of distress uh, having to do with what I've described as the dollar shortage. So unfortunately, the dollar shortage is not going to get better because the Fed is, is on this kamikaze mission to raise rates and make U.S. monetary policy even tighter. As I say, they'll wake up, but, but probably they'll be the last to know. So I would look for more, it's a more stress, a more drains from reserve positions and some of our ma major trading partners and more geopolitical risk, all of which will give a lift or at a minimum put a floor under the price of gold. Well, before we turn to Alex, uh, Jim, I'd like to ask you a rather broad question. Actually, it's a question I've been wanting to ask in some form for most of the last year. In the course of our interviews, I've often heard you comment, as you just did, on this dire state of the international monetary system. And often you'll say something to the effect, the trouble is they, meaning the world's financial authorities, they refuse to make the structural is necessary. That's the phrase I've heard you use a few times. And my question is, what structural changes? Or to put it another way, if you had the levers of monetary power in your hands for a day or a year or however long it would take, what would you do differently? Well, really good question, John. The, the problem is that having my hands on the monetary levers is a monetary solution, not a structural solution. So as a monetary solution, can you create easier monetary conditions or print money? Yes, you can, but that's not going to solve the problem. Indeed, it has not solved the problem for the last uh, eight years. So what, what do we mean by structural solutions? Uh, how do you implement those? What are they specifically? Those are all, all very good questions. And, and the point I make is that the, the weak growth, the, the looming recession, the global slowdown, all the stresses we're seeing around the world, all the things we've talked about uh, so far on this call are not amenable to monetary solutions. They require structural solutions. We are in a structural growth depression with emphasis on the word depression, and printing money won't fix it. So what are structural solutions? These are things that are more specifically in the hands of the fiscal authority rather than the monetary authority. The fiscal authority is the Congress or the legislature. It could be a Congress, it could be a parliament in the case of uh, you know, the UK or Canada or any other parliamentary democracy. Uh, it could be a council in the case of uh, you know, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. With whoever calls the shots, in other words, whoever makes the laws. They're the ones who are in a position to, to uh, 
uh, deal with structural problems and create structural solutions. Now, what are they? Well, let's start with taxes. Okay, tax policy is number one. Cut tax rates. You know, it's not, you don't need a PhD to figure that one out. Taxes in the U.S. are way too high. That's impeding growth. I think upwards of ten trillion dollars at this point of corporate cash that's sitting offshore that won't come back to the United States because our corporate taxes are too high. That's just one of many examples, but you could start with uh, tax rates. The regulatory uh, structure, I, again, I don't want to debate all these individual policies. You can pick any regulation you want and get into a policy debate, but the problem is that they just keep piling up, regardless of the intrinsic merits, and I don't you know, care whether it's you know transportation regulation or climate regulation or environmental regulation, you know, Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, on and on and on. We just keep piling up regulations. We make it harder and harder to do business, harder to start business, harder to create jobs. It should come as no surprise that the economy is slowing down. Better outcomes for women would be another very important point. Uh, I think the U.S. is pretty good on that score. We could do more to improve, but there are countries like Japan and certainly the Middle East where outcomes for women are, are not good at all, but if women could be more empowered, obviously they could be very productive, uh, very creative um, contributors to economic growth in their own countries. That would be the first one on my list for Japan, but you know, Japan's got its own cultural impediments, and of course we know what's going on in the Arab countries, so that's another thing that you could do. Immigration is another one. One of the reasons the U.S., people, you know, I, I don't like cliches, uh, but People keep using the expression, you know, the U.S. is the only, uh, you know, the, the least dirty shirt in the laundry. Uh, and those we're not great, but we're not as bad as everyone else. Uh, well, that's fine. Well, why are, why are we not as bad as everyone else? I mean, growth is weak, could be better, but why are we doing better than other people? Well, part of the reason is, is immigration. That's part of the reason Germany let in as many refugees as they did. That's turning out to have a lot of serious problems associated with it that Germany has to address. But uh, Germany was smart enough to know that, you know, if people aren't having babies, then you want to grow your labor force, you better get some immigration. This is another one. I mean, Japan, I'd be very bullish on the Japanese economy if they let in, you know, a million Filipino immigrants every year. I, I travel around the world. I go to the Middle East. You know, you go to a Catholic church in, in the Middle East, you know, you feel like you're in an underground society. They're usually behind high walls and barbed wires. But some of the countries there are, are actually uh, pretty tolerant, if you will. And I go to a Catholic church in a place like Bahrain, for example, and it's me and 5,000 Filipinos. I mean, because they're all there as guest workers and immigrants and, you know, people who are invited in to provide uh, labor and services. Well, Japan could do something similar, but they won't. You know, so uh, labor migration, uh, why can't we get excess labor from Greece and Spain into the Netherlands and Germany. I forget about refugees from Syria. How about just people from inside Europe, inside the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. So I could go on and on, but uh, taxation, regulation, outcomes for women, immigration, labor laws, labor mobility, this is what we mean by structural changes. So these are the things that we have to do to get growth going. Printing money won't do it. Well, when you look around the world, and I don't think there's going to be any, any big surprises in your answer to this question, but the question was to be asked, what are the chances of those changes being made? And if they aren't made, how should wise investors protect themselves? Unfortunately, the chances are very low. I mean, I just spent 10 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer, explaining the structural changes the world needs to make to encourage growth. Printing money won't do it. Structural changes will do it. Okay, where are the structural changes? Well, there are a million and one reasons. I could spend an hour, I won't, but I could spend an hour explaining why none of these things are happening. Too many vested interests, too much political posturing, too much partisanship, too many people looking out for themselves, not looking out for the country, too much ideological opposition. You know, the thing about ideology is it's the opposite of reality. Reality is take the facts as they are and you know, try to make things better. Ideology is, no, I've got an idea in my head and I'm going to try to implement my idea regardless of the cost. Well, that's fine, but uh, that's a good way to ruin an economy or ruin a country. So, so I, th I think we know what the solutions are and I wouldn't rule them out. I certainly look for them. But if you ask me what I think the odds of these things happening, what are the odds of Japan letting in a million Filipino immigrants? Zero. What are the odds of Arabia overnight you know, improving outcomes for women? Close to zero. What are the odds of the U.S. cutting corporate taxes? Close to zero, and so forth. So in other words, none of these things are happening. And so my forecast would be, at best, best case, more weak growth of the kind we've had, uh, worst case, maybe even likely at this point, uh, a recession. And then what will come from that is the Fed will, at some point, not right away, but at some point later this year, get off their kamikaze mission of tightening rates and maybe 
maybe actually turn around and provide some easing first and form of forward guidance and maybe by December or early in 2017 some rate cuts. You know, that could give markets a lift, but uh, it hasn't worked that well for the last seven years, so I don't know why that by itself would solve the problem. The thing that will turn things around is helicopter money. We've spoken about that before. Maybe that's one we can do uh, in our next call, John. But helicopter money is basically running bigger deficits, borrowing the money to cover the difference, and then monetizing the debt. So it's a form of money printing, but instead of just printing money and handing it to banks and having the banks hand it back to the Fed, that's QE. Here you print the money and buy debt that was used to run bigger deficits because the government's spending more money. That is something that I think is coming, probably more of a 2017 story, and that's the one that will get gold skyrocketing again because people will just look at that and say, aha, nothing else worked, uh, but you're determined to get inflation. If you can't do it with monetary policy, you're going to do it with deficits, and so now it's back to the 70s, and I think that's when gold will uh, really get a, a huge lift. I think it will get a, a good lift in the short run based on geopolitical vectors, but in the longer run, meaning 2017, 2018, the big boost to gold is going to come from helicopter money. Well, thanks, Jim. Now, Alex Stanzik is here with questions from our listeners, but just before you go there, Alex, I actually have a question for you. It's the start of the new year, and with Jim's book coming out in April, The New Case for Gold, could you tell us a little bit, Alex, about how you and Physical Gold Fund got to know Jim in the first place? I think it's a story our listeners would enjoy hearing. Sure, John. So Jim first came on my radar, I think, around the middle to early 2012. One of my research team came to me and said, uh, Alex, you need to come see this. There's this guy on Bloomberg that uh, he's talking about gold and, and he actually makes sense. So I watched the interview and I immediately thought to myself, okay, this guy gets it. And what I mean by that is, is that the thing that impressed me about Jim is he spoke the language of institutional investors. Typically, you get people you know, on talking about gold, and they're usually kind of framed in more of the, the gold bug category or maybe just a, a market analyst specialist, like a bank analyst that specializes in, in the metals market, for example. But Jim was the first guy I think I had ever seen who spoke this institutional language. So I bought his book. I read uh, his first book, Currency Wars, towards the end of 2012, and I decided that you know, it'd be really great if we could have Jim advising our board. So we reached out to him. At first, he was pretty understandably standoffish. I can only imagine how many gold-related businesses pitch him or talk to him or, or try to contact him about gold. But he agreed to meet with me. And so myself and another one of our directors, Nestor Casillero, we flew up to New York. We met with him. And I basically showed him what we were doing. Now, Jim, he's one of the smartest guys I know. Once I showed him how we had this whole thing structured, he immediately got it. He recognized right away that we weren't the typical fund in the space, and I think it's because of the way we do our vaulting and handle clearing risk, and we have an insistence on making sure everything's non-correlated to risk on a systemic level. So because of these things, I think he, he agreed to come on board with us, and, and I think he's going to talk much more about that in his book, but uh, that's basically how we met and how we agreed to start working together. Well, thanks, Alex. And now, what questions do you have today from our listeners? So we're going to start off, Jim. This question is coming in from what I think is an anonymous source because his name is John Galt III. Some of you may recognize that name. <laughs> <laughs> but his, his question is, Jeff Gundlach announced recently he's buying bonds denominated in currencies other than dollars for the first time in five years and that the dollar has topped. His question is, has the dollar topped? Not yet. It's getting close to a top. The dollar is at a 10-year high. It's not quite at an all-time high. I don't necessarily think it will get to an all-time high, but it does have a little more headroom. And here's the reason why. It's that the Fed is going to continue to raise rates. Now, the market right now, if you go back to the December FOMC uh, statement at press conference and the famous dots in the forecasts of the Fed, uh, FOMC members and so forth, it, it put the Fed on track for four interest rate hikes per year. So basically, every, one a quarter, every other meeting, they do eight meetings per year, 
So 25 basis points every other meeting. It, it was not automatic. They put in all the usual qualifiers, but that was the track they were on. The market doesn't believe it. The market, uh, if you look at the Fed Fund futures market, and says what are actual people betting real money in the markets? What are they discounting? What are they anticipating? They think maybe two. There's a little bit of a, a couple of people think three, but the, the view that there's going to be four is, is extremely low, but not zero. But the point is the Fed is, in my view, not looking at the market. They're looking at other things. They're looking at as I say, their models, which are based on things like Nairu and Phillips Curve, I don't need to digress into what those things are, but let's just say they're they're obsolete. So the Fed's actually going to keep raising rates, and as long as they do, they're going to sort of rebut or refute these market expectations. So if the market's pricing a low probability of four, and the Fed actually goes ahead with two, you got to price in some probability of number three and number four, and that's going to make the dollar a little bit stronger. Now, at some point, this will reverse. I gave some interviews uh, right around New Year's Eve that I called the year of the boomerang, meaning Janet Yellen threw her rate hike boomerang out there, and it's going to you know, go out for a while and then turn around and come back and uh, you know, maybe hit her in the head. Hopefully she'll duck. But the point being, the Fed's going to have to reverse course. They're going to have to turn on a dime and start cutting rates. But for the, for the reason I mentioned, I don't think they'll see that really until the summer then I think it will be impossible to cut because of politics. So the earliest I see the Fed cutting is December, which is about a year too late. They should have eased some more in December, maybe with negative rates or something else. So, so the point is, does it make sense? No. Is the Fed going down a, you know, a blind alley on a kamikaze mission? Yes. But be that as it may, it's going to tend to make the dollar stronger, particularly with China, Saudi Arabia, and others, uh, people trying to get their money out. I don't think it will be a lot stronger because there is a limit here, but uh, in the short run, I would expect the dollar to get, get stronger. Now, you got to pick your cross rate, right, because stronger against the euro or against the yen or against the yuan. I mean, the problem is when you do cross rates, it's always, or gold for that matter. I think of gold as a form of money, so you have to say compared to what. The, the euro might not go down. Uh, I don't see the euro getting a lot lower, but uh, certainly against the yuan, against Asian currencies. I mean, there's there's some currencies that are just spiraling out of control. South African rand, Brazil. I mean, the Canadian uh, loonie, the Canadian dollar called the loonie. I mean, these currencies are are getting whacked in the neck. So yeah, I do think the dollar will get a little bit. It's a little bit stronger, at least for a while. Okay, very good. I think that that's actually something that's on the mind of of quite a few investors who are watching global macro and how that's going to impact everything from commodities to everything else that they're doing. So the next question is coming from Joshua B. And his question kind of goes back a little bit to our earlier conversation on the Middle East, but it's referencing your first book. So uh, the question is, is the Gulf Cooperation Council still a feasible currency block with the price of oil as a currency peg, as you mentioned in Death of Money? It is feasible, and I think it's a good idea for them. And I've been in the Persian Gulf uh, and recommended this to policymakers there. I don't think it's happening, at least not in the short run. So it's one of these things that, you know, just because it makes sense doesn't mean it, it's going to happen. You know, we talked about divisions inside the uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Well, there are lots of rivalries and jealousies among these Arab kingdoms and, you know, the UAE and. Bahrain and Kuwait and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, they can't even agree on where to put the central bank. Like when they, they had some conversations, they said, well, hey guys, why don't we start with where do we put the central bank and then we'll figure out what the central bank should look like. They couldn't even agree on that. I mean, Abu Dhabi wanted it in Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia was insisting it be in Riyadh. So they didn't really get off the dime. So is it feasible? Is it a good idea? Yes. Could it ultimately peg to the price of oil or a commodity basket or some other index, which the Chinese have just done, by the way. They, the way the Chinese wiggled out from under their dollar peg is to say, well, we're still pegging. We're just pegging to something else. Well, it, turned, it turned out that something else is a, a wholly invented trade-weighted basket of currencies based on their trading partners. So it's got the Russian ruble and the, the Malaysian ringgit and all these other uh, uh, sort of uh, off-the-run currencies in there. Uh, so the Chinese are saying, well, we're pegging to these other things, not the dollar. So could Saudi Arabia and the GCC do something similar? Yes, but I don't, I don't see that right away. Now, the next question is going to actually come from our, from our research team. There's a gentleman amongst our team who follows different ratios and different indices. And one of the ratios that he's followed for a number of years, and I've known this guy for almost a decade now, but he tracks very closely the oil gold ratio. 
and that how historically speaking, it's, it, there's an average and uh, it typically comes back to a mean every now and then. But when it's really out of whack, like it is right now, it often is coinciding with some kind of major uh, geopolitical event. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think gold is too high? Oil is too low? Do you think that there's some kind of impending, it's signaling possibly some kind of impending uh, crisis? What do you think? First of all, I think it's a very interesting question and set up, Alex, and I look at the gold-oil ratio myself, and, uh, you know, around 16 to 1, and right now it's a little bit closer to, uh, you know, 40 to 1, so uh, it is, those are not the exact numbers, they're approximate, I'm just kind of doing this off the top of my head, but that is way out of whack. So what it implies is that either gold has to come way down or oil has to go way up or they have to meet in the middle, but the problem is, and the reason the ratio is out of whack is that, you know, when we say, you know, what we're talking about are barrels of oil to ounces of gold, or at least that's one way to think about it. But you have to convert them both to dollars to just do the math. And so the thing that's really out of whack is the dollar. The dollar is way too strong. So the ratio is based on inflation, right? Inflation, deflation. The economy slows down, you get more deflation, the price of oil goes down, demand for oil goes down, but deflationary means high real interest rates. It's usually pretty bad for the price of gold, so the price of gold would go down. So within a range, that ratio would be maintained, and the opposite is true. When you get inflation, all of a sudden, you know, the price of oil goes up and the price of gold goes up, and again, the, the dollar, we're talking about the dollar price, so the ratio is maintained. So that's why that ratio exists. That's why it's constant, because they're really just two alternatives, two stores of wealth that are both alternative to the dollar, and if they're constant in real terms, which they are over a long period of time, then, then the ratio should exist. But what's going on now is that you've got something else going on, which is that gold is not trading just like a commodity. Gold is trading like money, and it's trading as perhaps a new form of money pegged to the Chinese currency or the Russian currency. In other words, the way to think of the question is, consider the alternative. Why isn't gold lower? In other words, oil has come down, iron or copper, bauxite. All these commodities have come way down. Gold is gold's off the top, obviously, but um, you know, relative to 2011. But it, in percentage terms, it has not come down as much as all these other commodities. So why is gold actually doing relatively well compared to everything else? Well, the answer is that there's a, a kind of a floor under it, and I don't want to say, suggest it's a hard floor, but the Chinese have a bid. The Chinese are in the process of reallocating their reserve position out of dollars into gold, or at least re, I'm not saying they're dumping all their dollars, although you know a trillion dollars have practically walked out the door, but they are in a rebalancing. So that rebalancing, which will not last forever, but may last for two or three more years, is why the ratio is out of whack. So ultimately that ratio will be restored. It will probably be restored in the form of much higher oil prices once the inflation kicks in. But the inflation's not here. The way I expect it to be restored is that we'll get, we'll have one more lousy year, then we'll get to helicopter money, then the inflation will take off, and then oil will start to go up and gold will start to go up, but oil will go up a little faster and then the ratio will be restored. So there is a geopolitical shock behind it, but it's a it's a hidden shock. It's, a, it's not a war. It's a behind-the-scenes effort by the Chinese to acquire massive amounts of gold through stealth and deception. That's the shock. That's what's getting it out of line. That will be restored when two things happen. One, the Chinese get a lot more gold, so they feel that they can match the U.S. in terms of a gold-to-GDP ratio. And two, uh, when the helicopter money kicks in and both things go up, and in that world, oil will go up a little faster and the ratio will be restored. Okay, so just from my kind of personal perspective, what I'm hearing you say is that 2016, we're looking at much of the same with some slight fluctuations, but 2017 possibly we're looking at uh, inflation starting to kick in in earnest, and then it's off to the races from there. The, the, world ha the world has to get inflation. It has to get inflation. It's not pleasant. It's a form of theft. I'm not advocating for inflation, but as an analyst, it's not my job to be an advocate. It's my job to get the analysis right. And the global monetary elites have to cause inflation because there's no other way to pay the debt. It's just that they've failed to do so for the last seven years, but they're going to keep trying.
Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. As always, a very illuminating conversation. I also want to thank our listeners for all the questions they've submitted. We have far too many questions than we have available time to ask, but I want to encourage you all to continue to submit questions because this dialogue that we've developed with you has really shaped the uh, the conversations that we've had with Jim over the last couple of years. So that said, I'm going to turn it back over to John. Thanks, Alex. You couldn't have better. And, and thank you. Let me add my thanks to you, Jim. Fantastic start to the year's uh, programs. It's always a pleasure and an education having you with us. And let me also add my thanks to our listeners for spending time with us today and encourage you to follow Jim on Twitter. His handle is at James G. Ricketts. So goodbye for now, and we look forward to joining you again soon. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles with Jim Ricketts, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and other world-class thinkers.